What's up guys, this is Jaws and welcome back to another episode of In The Tank. If you're not familiar with In The Tank, that is totally cool. My name is Jaws. I am a full-time music producer and internationally touring DJ back when touring was a real thing. And with all this free time I've had, I've put it towards things like this podcast. Uh, In The Tank is all about me bringing my friends both from music and outside of music to talk about our lives, what's going on in the world, and most importantly, hopefully leave you with at least a couple pieces of uh, information, life lessons, whatever it may be, that you can use to improve your life on a day-to-day basis. And on that note, uh, today's episode is a perfect example of that. Today, I'm interviewing my friend, one of my best friends in the world, one of the people I've known longest in music. He goes by the name of Gastly. Uh, He's originally from Arizona, moved out to LA to pursue his dreams. We've known each other forever. And while David is successful now, a lot of this podcast centers around his struggles and his journey to make it uh, make it happen. David was living in a van for a really long time, considered homeless, working dead end jobs, and still had the drive to push through all of that and end up being a super successful uh, touring musician. And I think it's a story that everyone needs to uh, listen to, to watch, and realize that regardless of what you do in life, it doesn't have to be music at all. Um, Anything is possible as long as you believe in yourself and you work hard enough. And I know, I know it's cheesy and you hear it all the time, but David's story is a perfect, perfect case of that ideology put to use. Uh, We also talk about a lot of other, you know, fun, cool stuff. It's not all super serious, but I really think that this is, if there's any episode of In the Tank to watch, this is the one. Um, With that said, why don't we get into the episode? Before we get started, actually, I do want to note that whether this is your first time finding out about the podcast or you've been listening to the episodes uh, everywhere that podcasts are available or you've been watching them on YouTube, there's a chance that you might not have hung out with us yet on Twitch. And to me, that is a problem. I stream on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Jaws Official every single Monday, Wednesday, Thursday at 5 Pacific. And on Thursdays is when the live recording of In The Tank happens. So come be a part of podcast history. You can ask questions to the people that I'm interviewing. You can ask me questions. You can make comments and odds are I might read it and then it ends up in the podcast forever. It's pretty cool. Um, So yeah, I think that that sells itself. Come hang out with us, twitch.tv slash Jaws Official. Now that I have that out of the way, let's get into the episode in the tank with Gasly. There we go. Look at that beautiful baby boy. What's up, brother? How you doing? Good. Everyone, chat, say hello to the ghost with the What's most, up, David Lee Crow, oh, yeah, in the chat. a.k.a. Oh, yeah, in the chat. Gasly. Um, hey. Well, I'm completely unprepared today for this. Okay. That's cool, man. You know that what? Was I. <laughs> you know what? You know what, chat? You're going to make me do it, aren't you? I thought that after last week's podcast, you would behave, but apparently not. So unfortunately for you, I have to go and turn off the fucking extension that allows you to fart emote with sound during this interview. You can't be trusted. (laughs) You goddamn savages. I was like doing like a, not a serious interview, but like, you know, an interview with a homie of mine. And chat is just redeeming fucking fart sounds that are in the recording for the podcast that's going to be going out to, like, the world and the internet. And I'm like, yo, like, it's it's funny during, like, you know, our actual Twitch chat, but, like, what if a random person is like, oh, man, I really want to learn more about David Lee Crow, a.k.a. Gasly, and then there, there's just a bunch of farts clouding up our conversation. Chat. I guess I wouldn't be entirely opposed to that, to be honest. I mean, I know. And, I know. and by the way, Sam, if you give a kid a BB gun and he shoots his eye out, you can't really blame the kid. Yeah, 
I, I okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Um okay. I do have some things written up, but um <laughs> while we were waiting for you, I didn't really know what I was going to do on the stream cuz I started at like 5:30 and we were kind of just hanging out and I forgot that I had agreed to make a theme song for James Coletta cuz he's now a Twitch streamer as well. And he sent me the most disgusting like graphic horrible audio samples from his stream like things that like not even i don't think you would say and uh i've really i've i've, I've been in the throes of making his theme song so now i need to uh, get myself out of meme mode and into interviewer boy mode uh let me pull up i can't even remember what the fuck we were going to talk about honestly these things are well, i kind of i would actually kind of like to hear whatever you got going there just out of pure curiosity, you described it. Uh, well, I just quit Ableton, so you're gonna you're gonna have to wait. I hate to break it to you, Mister Crow. You're gonna tell me the synopsis and no storyline. All right. Uh, okay. So here's is. here's one of the here's one of the samples from James. Uh, what was it, Chat? I mean, the buildup was built off of a vocal of his that says, "I'm gonna nut." Uh, there was something about uh, being something about uh, a being a fat, wet gorilla grip pussy. Um, nice. Yeah, fat, wet gorilla grip <laughs> pussy. There we go. Um, yeah, it was. It was the mixer one was also good. Yeah, it was. Uh, it, it was. It was a lot. Okay, cool. So let's pretend like we just started the podcast because honestly, people that are watching the podcast on YouTube or are listening to it um, everywhere that podcasts are you know, distributed, whether that's Spotify podcasts, Apple Music, whatever, whatever, where this will go eventually, are not going to hear any of this. So I'm going to pretend like we started on time and we were completely prepared. So three, two, one. I'll keep your secret if uh, everyone in the chat does. The chat, the chat are homies. They, they got All it. Right. They got it. All right. Everyone, please say hello. The ghost with the most, David Lee Crow. I'm, I know that all of you guys know who David is in the chat. But like I was saying earlier, this is now a podcast. It's going to be watched by a lot of people on YouTube that might not know who either of us are. And also probably more likely on uh, Spotify podcasts, Apple Music podcasts, you know, wherever you listen to podcasts. There are probably people that are going to stumble upon this. Maybe don't know who Gasly is. Maybe don't know who Jaws is. Uh, but right now we're worried about you, David Gasly. So I obviously have known Gasly, David, for years. For years and years and years. So I know a lot about him. But just for fun, I decided to go take a peek at your Wikipedia page today. <laughs> and uh, so I have a couple, like, you know, uh, uh, you know quick hot topics that you know i think are relevant for people to know and even if you're a fan of ghastly there are some things in here that you might not know so really quick if you don't know who ghastly is he goes or sorry he goes by ghastly his real name is david lee crow he was raised on a goat farm with and correct me if i'm wrong david but your wikipedia right. says you were raised on a goat farm with 260 goats and 650 cows in buckeye arizona well, that's actually a little bit skewed. I've lived on two farms throughout my childhood. There was the first one was uh, was a 650 cow farm, and then my parents uh, sold that farm and started a smaller one that was a goat farm. Okay. So yes, the, both of the they are they are falsely true. Just two truths mixed into one lie. <laughs> right. It's not it's not a lie. It's just uh, a mistruth, I guess. Yeah, it's it's a it's definitely convoluted, but ultimately, yeah, lots of goats, lots of cows. Yeah, say la vie. So, here's something that I know is true. For a long time, when David lived moved to Los Angeles, he was quote unquote homeless, living in a van. Um, what I didn't know, apparently, you worked at American Apparel for two months, who later fired you for finding out that you lived in a van. Uh, another thing that I knew is that, yeah, and you might not, true. Um, David was one of the two vocalists in the deathcore band, The Irish Front. 
Uh, and as most of you know, I'm a huge metal guy. David, obviously a huge metal guy. It's one of the reasons that we became friends so many years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, what oh, yeah. wasn't on the Wikipedia, which I'm pretty pissed off about, is that it doesn't mention the six months that David was my roommate living on my couch. Because <laughs> I feel like those were the most formative moments of both of our careers. And they we, were. I, I want to I wanna talk about it, you know, uh, in in a little bit but yeah that's that's about mm. all you really if you didn't know who ghastly was now you know quite a bit about him and the next time that someone brings up that dj ghastly you can be like did you know he lived on a farm with 650 cows when he was growing up and then also <laughs> 260 goats but not at the same time they were two separate farms <laughs> and they would be like what you gotta add that detail fuck? if you want to say if you if you want to if you want to combat fake news you have to add that detail you Absolutely. have to add that extra detail Two different farms. <laughs> we don't we don't fucks with the fake news around here. Okay, the uh, yeah. last thing that I want to add to this, kind of the the start and finish of the ghastly story, is that recently, um, as most of your fans know, but maybe people who are listening don't, you recently moved back to Arizona from Los Angeles. So mm -hmm. now I've talked a lot about who ghastly is. I want you to give us kind of a, a real brief introduction as if you're talking to someone who has no idea who you are for the first time right all right <clears throat> uh my name is david crow also go by ghastly as a dj i produce uh dance music bass music electronic in all different kinds and forms i originated as an individual who was just a, a broke ass kid living on a farm and then eventually decided to you know, suck it up enough to take the big risk, move to LA in a van, spent about four years living out of my van and then getting jobs and then getting apartments and getting fired from those jobs and getting evicted from those apartments and then eventually living on your couch and then uh, taking all the big risks and actually having to move back to Arizona and start over again, get a new van, drive out there again, and then go towards my that goal wasn't, once again. That wasn't after... You lived on the couch. That was though, right? no, yeah. That part that that was that was before. That okay. was before. That okay. you, when we met, I had already moved back from my first big failure. Right. Because right, I was right. in LA for like uh, three years, three and a half years actually. Okay. Before I ran out of money, lost my job, lost my uh, apartment, and pretty much had to look at myself in the mirror and be like, "Hey, you fucking blew it, bud. Time to go back and start over." So. Yeah, I really want to, I, I, I think, I think that's a lot of what I want to focus this episode around. Cause obviously, I mean, you know, if people are fans of yours, they know a lot of stuff about you. I'm sure you've been on a lot of podcasts, done a lot of interviews, blah, 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 whatever, where you've talked about a bunch of kind of, you know, meaningless bullshit, like me asking you to describe who you are and what you came from and what you've accomplished and whatever, you know, like everyone has done that. We've all done that interview, right? So like. If that's yeah. all I'm going to do here, why the fuck am I starting a podcast, right? Like, what? my goal with this podcast is to, you know, A, talk to my friends in, like, you know, real, like, normal, like, uh, uh, what's the word? You know, organic ways, like, normal, like, talking like we're homies and whatever. But also, really, you know, uh, I guess my goal is, like, every time someone listens to the podcast they hear something or learn something that is relatable to anyone in any position in their life, you know, something that they can learn and use to improve on themselves. Because something that I've learned during COVID is that if you aren't consistently improving your life when you're stuck at home doing nothing, then you're fucking up. You know what I mean? And so my goal with the podcast is to kind of be a catalyst for people to, you know, listen to it, uh, you know, uh, hear from people that they they are fans of, but also be like, oh, fuck, I never thought about it like that. I'm going to take that little nugget of information that he said just while they were having a conversation, and I can use that to make myself a better painter or a better writer or a better fucking, you know, sitting at a desk. Or doing just it. a better person. Or just a better person, exactly. And I think something that you can talk about better than pretty much any single person in our industry... <laughs> As far as, you know, electronic music is concerned, because, you know, the 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 broke, you know, struggling artist trope is not something that is unfamiliar in music. Yeah, it's actually the core of most artists. Like. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, you know, we all lived it in our own ways, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, when, when we lived together, you know, sure, you were living on the couch and I had an actual room, but most days I, I couldn't afford anything <laughs> than a pack of cigarettes and, and a coffee, and my roommates paid for my food a lot of the time. And like, I had no money. Like, we were all fucking broke pieces of shit just trying to make music and get by day to day and, you know, just, like, live our lives. And I think that a lot of people... Uh, someone in the chat said, how dare I not snuggle him? How do you know we didn't snuggle? We we may have... <laughs> we We probably snuggled on that couch all the fucking time. But that's irrelevant. So... Uh, okay, so we know who we know who Gasly is, right? We know what you've gone through. We know your kind of general story. Um, so I kind of want to fast forward from in, in the past, so to speak, to you moved back to Arizona, and then you came back to LA. You got a job at EDM.com as a reporter, right? Or was it your EDM? Right. Uh, no, it was EDM.com. I yeah. was a reporter for them, and I was also doing um, I was I was doing what's it called <laughs> promotion and selling bottle VIP service for um, Exchange LA. Oh yeah, I totally forgot about that. And you were playing in the little side room. Yeah, I was playing the side room. I started in the very bottom side room, and then they, I could open there, and then I worked my way up after I sold enough VIP tables that I could open up the main room, and that was like. For me, that was just like this huge staple of like, you're on the right path, you know? And like, and when I look back on it, it seems from, from where I can stand now, it definitely seems small, but I, I know in my heart that I couldn't have, uh, like that victory, uh, really amplified my motivation and made me give even more fucks. Like I had no time to produce, but I still found time. Like I was working two jobs. I was a server and a host and I was writing for you edm.com and i was uh promoting for exchange la while writing my own music and trying to create this whole brand and you know i i that's why whenever i hear someone tell me like oh i just don't have time you know i get home late and it's like do you not have time or do you just prefer to sit on netflix and it's okay we all do it like we're all guilty of that this is you have to be literally honest with yourself this is exactly the conversation that I wanted to have because, uh, you know, there's a similar theme that runs <laughs> through a lot of the episodes that is basically what you're saying right now. But I think that it's a concept that needs to be driven into people's heads so much because, you know, I feel that's like facts. that's the most that common thing that I hear, whether it's, you know, I'm doing, you know, uh, music production stuff on the stream or I see a fan out around town or I'm at a show or whatever uh, and and so many th people it's like you know oh it's so hard to get into music and you know it's all about luck and blah blah blah, blah. like no like mm. luck is earned no. by working your fucking your 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 ass Absolutely. off you know Absolutely. and like i i think that you are an incredible example of, of that but okay so i'm getting sidetracked so no, we, but those are those are real words. You, yeah. You're an example of that exact same luck, one hundred percent. Yeah, for like, sure. But like, my point is, we'll we'll get. I'll never into forget you. when you wrote "Feel the Volume" and you played that for me the first time. That was so cool. Yeah, I mean, okay, that that's a whole story for a different day. But the the fact that that song is like what made my career happen, and I literally wrote it on a couch while I was baked, literally as a joke. Like it was literally a joke. And then mm -hmm. that ended up being the catalyst for my entire career. It just, it, it blows my fucking mind, but That's awesome, man. I want to backtrack because the whole point of me telling that, you know, story of you being the, the writer and whatever is that's how we met is I had no mm -hmm. idea that you were a musician of any sort. It was that me and Keaton, who you guys know as Sullivan King, were putting out our very first song that was released on a label uh, the label was Bygore. Um, and uh, you came as a representative of EDM.com to interview us, I think, about the song and some That's other right. random bullshit. That's right. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I remember like... I haven't thought about that in a long time. I know. And the funny thing to me, thinking back on it, is like, I know you so well now that like I know the ghastly characters. You know what I mean? <laughs> 
Like yeah. <laughs> I know, I know real David. I know Ghastly. I know, uh, you know, like the the proper like I'm gonna make myself seem like a professional Ghastly. Yeah. And that was the first one that I met. Was the I'm gonna make much. myself seem like a professional Ghastly because you interviewed us. I was representing us. EDM.com. Yeah. No. Totally. <laughs> and. You know, but it was so funny that like, you know, I was just like, oh, wow, this kid is like, he's, he seems like pretty, pretty intelligent. And then after the interview is done and you're like, like, what are you guys doing? Like, what are you working on? We start playing music together. And then like, we're all like, oh shit, we're all kind of doing the same shit. And literally like, like a switch, it went from like professional, like businessman gas lead to like, you know, uh god i can't even think of you know uh uh born to die ghastly born to die born to die it's <laughs> <laughs> real bro. oh man um so yeah that's how ghastly and i met and basically like after that day i started seeing david at icon the music school music school that i went to like pretty much every single day like more or less and oh, that yeah. and that evolved into this, you know, friendship of like I was like, oh, this guy is cool. And honestly, I'll give credit to Keaton because Keaton is the one who would you would always come to Icon to hang out with and write yeah, music he gave with. Me the guest pass. Yeah, he would always bring you into Icon as his guest and whatever. And then you just ended up being there so much. And I think what it really is, honestly, is and I don't know if this is true or not, but I imagine that at that point we probably ended up talking so much and becoming friends because we both smoked cigarettes. So we had to go yeah, outside that's... to that little area outside of Icon and chain smoke cigarettes because I would literally, like, yeah. I would work for 50 minutes and then I would go smoke a bone and then I would go back in and, like, I'm, I'm sure that, like, our, our, our smoke breaks aligned at the same time and we were, like, ended up becoming friends because of it. And I'm not saying that smoking is okay. Cause I think we both agree that, uh, tobacco is pretty shitty. Yeah. I'm just on nicotine now. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe it, maybe it started our friendship. You never know. No, I, I don't deny that at all, man. That actually, I, um, I would, I've remembered multiple relationships that were developed off of the most minute detail, whether it be smoking a cigarette or buying someone a drink or them buying you a drink or even just like that sub that subtle quick interaction that just brings you both into one point of time where it's like all right well let's chat and then you you know then that you just suss it out from that point on i feel like a lot of people miss that in um in a lot of music schools is just the act of getting to know someone as far as like if you're interested in the music industry you have to also know how to treat individuals as individuals and not as if they have this status above you or anything of this nature. You have to treat them like they're an actual individual who can um, not only uh, become a great friend, but also someone who can help you evolve in the future. Of course, you should always go into it developing the friendship first. Like the friendship is so important. And if you just introduce yourself in a calm demeanor and, you know, like I said, I've said it before. If you treat someone as an individual, they will look at you with a much grander stare than if, because they can see it, we can see it. And I've had it happen to me multiple times where someone comes up and the second word out of their mouth is, will you follow me on Instagram? And can I send you my demo? It's like, you don't see me as a person. You see me as an outlet to get your music out there, which I can respect the hustle, but you're going about it the wrong way. You have to treat people like people because that's what we are. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have anything to add to that. You basically <laughs> nailed it right on the fucking head. Um, I, so, and you know, I, I, I can kind of like echo what you're saying because, you know, even when I, my career kind of started to take off, I guess if you want to call it that, uh, you know, when mm -hmm. I was, uh, I was still going to icon all the time when I lived in North Hollywood, right. You know, I was still going right. in to school at least once a week. Just because I loved hanging out there, I loved the vibe, but every week that I would go back, you know, more and more people would start coming up to me and being like, oh, bro, your jaws? Like, blah, 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 blah. And I, like, especially back in the day, like, I was not, you know, used to that. So it was super weird for me. And the people that I'm friends with yeah. at Icon, or from Icon still to this day, 
are always the people that like they never even mentioned who i was they just had conversations with me they were super cool they were super normal and then after you know maybe a couple weeks months whatever the fuck it is you know then they would be like hey by the way like you want to check out one of my songs or like something you know what i mean but they just treated me like a right. human and not like a oh my god i can't believe it's you i'm such a blah 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 blah, blah. you know whatever it is um you know, those are the people that I remember from Icon or that I still talk to to this day, you know, because like you said, mm -hmm. it's like none of us like, OK, uh, that's that's probably an overstatement. I was going to say none of us want to be treated like anything other than just a normal person. That's probably false, because I'm sure there are a lot of people in music that specifically are in it because they want to be treated like more yeah, than just a normal there's person. There's definitely nuance. There's yeah. definitely nuance there. There's there are definitely the egotistical maniacs for sure. Yeah, but like for people like us, like you know, it's super cool that we get to do what we do for a living, and we're you know super grateful and whatever. But by no means do I, f I, I'm way more happy being able to go out and do my normal life and live like a human. Like you know, if if someone was like, hey, like you know, uh, give me $500 and I'll make you as famous as Justin Bieber tomorrow, you know, and you'll be like, <laughs> that, uh, dude, that's it, dude. You gotta, you gotta tell me, you gotta, no, if I'm, if I'm going through the Illuminati, like if, if I'm going to get Justin Bieber fame, I want to be in the Illuminati 100%. Okay. That's not, I know that's what not, I'm missing out that's on. not my point at all, David. That's not my oh, fucking okay. point. My point is <laughs> if I had the option to tomorrow turn into Justin Bieber level fucking famous, I don't think I would do it because I don't think I'm built for that. Like, I don't think that I could live not being able to go out and live a normal life. I don't know if I could be mm. able to live not being able to just go to Costco or go to fucking Starbucks or whatever the fuck it is. You know what I mean? Like the, the, the shit that those people have to deal with is fucked up, man. And like, you know, the, the worst that it gets for me is like, you know, every now and then someone will be like, yo, are you fucking Jaws? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, that's tight. I'm like, all right, cool. And that's it. Like, we don't have people swarming around us like paparazzi, like literally making yeah. it not be not, not you not be able to live your life. Like the, the most that's going to happen is someone's going to come up, say hi, maybe ask for a picture and then let you keep living your life. You know, we have this level oh, that's, of that's real. Yeah, we have this level of, you know, quote unquote fame, but it doesn't hold a candle to anyone that's truly, really famous. And honestly, I, I, I wouldn't want it for myself. You know what I mean? I can totally get that, brother. Um, I was uh, about two or three years ago. No, it was about two years ago. I was in L.A. with uh, a friend who doesn't need to be named necessarily. But we, we were literally just at this like haunted uh, theme park thing. And as we were walking out, just cameras came out of nowhere and just surrounded us. And I was like, Oh God, this is horrendous. And they're all just yelling and yelling and yelling at her. And I was just like, wow, this is definitely something that like, you know, the closest I've had to that experience is something that I'm prepared for, you know, like, all right, we're going to go here and we're going to do this. And there's going to be a lot of media and footage, but having right. someone, you know, having the ability, the inability to just walk into a vehicle without over 40 different cameras, just pop out of nowhere and swarm you yelling and, and blocking your vehicle. I mean, I'm sure for those people, there's that first moment, like, yes, I made it. I'm so successful that people just follow me. Yeah. And then, you know, that fades, that's going to fade. That is going to fade. You're not going to enjoy that forever. And then one day you can't even go fucking get a Big Mac in a robe because it'll be it'll be all over Twitter making fun of you or something like this, you know? Yeah, dude. And so my my whole point of of talking about all of this is that, you know, we are those people. I I, I can definitely say it for myself and I feel like I can say it for you as well. We are those people that would rather just be, you know, kind of incognito, regular ass dudes than, you know, the having this this crazy level of fame and i i don't really remember where i was going with this except for the fact that i think it was to prove your point about the uh concept of being able to understand how to you know make real genuine connections 
in the industry. Yes. You know, the point yes, that you were kind absolutely. of talking about. No, that's true. That's and, true. and, you know, it's, it's really all about your, your, your mental state. Cause it's like, you know, a, another question that I get all the fucking time about icon or a comment that I hear all the time is, Oh yeah, I'm going to, I think I want to go to icon collective music school because of all the networking that I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. And you know, the, 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 response that i have to that is if that's your goal then don't fucking go because if that's what your plan is at icon and you're going to use it just as a giant melting pot of hey we should link and do this and hey we should link and do this and like oh like is someone famous going to come into school and give me my big break like that's not going to fucking happen like it didn't happen for any of us like ever yeah you know what i mean (laughs) no like we all we all had this really organic growth together. It was very odd and, and very cool to watch, you know, uh, everyone from uh, Keizo, OK, me, you, Miha. We all just started, like, taking off right around the same time in, in the same little capsule. Yeah, because really we, had, cool. we had each other as a community. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, that's real. And, and like, yeah. that's the networking that you need is, like, your real support system, like, your true peers – that you can like build something incredible with, you know what I mean? And like, we, you know, uh, like, especially like the quote unquote, like West coast house scene, you know, it was like me, you, Tony, sunburn, uh, Drezo Joyride, uh, like, mm-hmm. you know, five or 10 other dudes. And, you know, we had this, especially when space yacht first started and it was just like this artist oh, hangout, yeah. That like, you know, we would go every Tuesday and there was no one there besides our crew and we would just play music for fun and like have this like super friendly competitive like one upping of each other all the time where we were like, you know, like this song is sick. Oh, we'll listen to this. Oh, we'll listen to this. And we all like amped each other up to like keep like being like, yeah. oh, fuck, I'm not I'm not the shit. You know what I mean? Like. I thought I was the shit. Absolutely, man. But like, listen to that song that David made. Listen to that song that Tony made. Listen to that song Kevin made. Like, whoever it is. And like, that's the net. My point is, that's the networking you need. It's not that you need to meet fucking, you know, Armin Van Buren, who's doing a fucking seminar at Icon Collective, and, you know, hand him a USB, and that's how your career is going to start. That's never going to fucking happen. It's never going to fucking happen. You know what I mean? It could happen, but it's a much smaller chance. Have you ever received a USB from someone that had a song that was so good on it that you did everything in your power to make them the next ghastly? Because I'll tell you what, I fucking have it. Yes, I have. Okay, and who was it? But well, it was Night Out. Uh, was the was the group? But we got into this weird legal thing it's funny because when you take a chance on someone who hands you a usb you never really know exactly what you're going to get on the other side of that uh-huh. and I heard, I heard the song was amazing and it was really good and we actually collaborated on another song together right and but there it came to a strange point where they decided to involve lawyers on something we were all in agreement on but it, we don't need to go into these details too deeply because it is what it is. But ultimately, um, they ended up showing a side of themselves that I had not foreseen there. And once it veered into the way, I was like, oh, that's, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. And and I've I've definitely, you know, when you when you started a label, that's that's kind of your same essential uh, totally kind of median is it you know you yeah. want you want to bring people up you want to you know expose the world to new artists through uh your fan base and people who find the collective and that's and that's the best that we can do honestly at that, the end of exactly. the day is to that's, try and share yeah. yeah so but that's my point is if i find a song on the usb that is the most fire thing that i've ever heard the best that i can do is put it on my label you know what I mean? And promo the shit out of it and do whatever I can, but that's still not going to change anyone's career. You know what I mean? It's literally all about what you do with whatever opportunity is presented to you. You know what I mean? I, we, I agree with that. We yeah. both know hundreds, and I, I'm not <clears throat> exaggerating when I say hundreds, hundreds of music producers just like you and I 
who were given incredible opportunities and for one reason or another weren't able to capitalize on it and aren't here today. You know what I mean? And a lot of that has to do with mm-hmm. timing and luck and the right branding and the right work ethic and whatever. But like my, my point is at the end of the day, you know, back to the beginning, if you're going to a school or a place like icon, hoping to meet your dream idol DJ and give them one song that's going to change your life. Like you're in a fucking showtime special. It's not how the world works. Right. You yeah. know what I mean? I, I would, I would have to agree with you down that line of thinking by adding that. I, I, I feel like a great amount of it comes from preparation and luck like yeah it, it, hell yeah you can prepare as much as you can and then have this incredible opportunity fall into your lap but you're not prepared enough for it and so instead of looking at that failure as oh there it goes that was my big opportunity it's gone watch it fly away that's just a sign that you're on the right track there's going to be another opportunity come your way you just have to prepare more you have to keep on preparing and preparing and then one day you're gonna have this a uh, catalog of art that is at your at your best peak level or at least you're most prepared to share and suddenly this incredible occurrence just seems to happen when you have that kind of compa- not compassion when you have that kind of passion and focus and drive on your shit it just gets so good that it magnetizes people into your life that say hey 100% do dude. you make music you know yeah <laughs> oh that's tight you know yeah and then one day yeah um okay Couple of things from the chat that I want to uh, bring up here. Um, Reckless asked, can you give an example of what qualifies as a missed opportunity? And I won't give you a real one, but I'll give you one that I think everyone can understand. Um, let's say that Skrillex came through your school, whether it's Icon or some other school, or just you happen to be sitting in a coffee shop and Skrillex walks in and you send him, you hand him a USB and he hears your song and he thinks it's incredible and he wants to put it out on his label and blah, 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 whatever. That's a huge opportunity. Now, if you don't have like five massive records in the pipeline ready to go right after that, then by the time that you've figured out what your next big song is going to be after you put out a song with Skrillex, it's already going to be too late. You know what I mean? Like... And that's one of the things that I feel like helped me a lot. And I'm sure David Gasly can say the same. When when I started oh, the yeah. Jaws project, I had like 30 songs saved up. You know what I mean? Just waiting mm-hmm. for that opportunity. You know, so that when when any anything like that would happen, it was like, boom, I have another, you know, three months of songs to just keep pumping out all the fucking time. Um Next, um, what was I going to say? Uh, Mr. Trap House said, I went to Icon and met DJ Snake, so I guess it worked, smiley face. Did it work in the sense that you got to meet DJ Snake and say hi? Or did you give him a song that he signed to his label and now you're like uh, an established artist? You know what I mean? And that's the point. Is like If your goal is to meet a famous artist then totally do it but if you're the the point here and we're getting a little contrived but i think it's worth you know kind of putting a nail in it um if you are hoping that anyone whether they're super famous or not is going to be directly related to your success anyone other than yourself it's not going to happen and i think that again Oh, you were happy to meet him, which is awesome. That's that's super great. That's super cool. Not necessarily my point. This actually segues really well into what I really want to talk about in this episode with you, David, which is you went from being fucking homeless in Los Angeles to now making an amazing life for yourself. And I mm-hmm. guarantee that without even asking you, I can say that the only person that made that fucking happen was you. Absolutely. But I see, I I agree with you 100% that you have to take the charge, you have to take the reins, and you have to be the one who really brings that fundamental change and drive and focus into your life. But at the same time, I would I would also add that I could not have gotten the balls to take that chance. 
if it wasn't for, say, my Uncle John tell me one day he was like, David, you got a great talent. You got a great skill. You should go to L.A. He told me that when I was like 15 or 16. And when he said those words, they they really stuck with me. And and it gave me this like light of hope that, you know, if this guy can see it, if he thinks that I can do it, then I I bet I could do it. So I, I do feel that there's like this this structure below every artist, like every single person that we see on in our media or what have you, every single one of them has this long history of individuals they had to interact with to get to that point. A hundred percent. Whether it be their parents all the way to the person who gave them the job and everything in between, all of those things kind of built them to that point. But it is like it is like what you're saying, 100 percent, that you have to be the one that puts yourself in those positions and, you know, heeds those words of advice when they're told to you and takes advantage of those opportunities. Um, so I think what you're talking about right now is kind of parallel to the point that I was mm. making. You know what I mean? I think, you uh, know, go ahead. As, as much as I've said, you know, no one can make your career happen other than you. In the same breath, you need a team, you need a support system, and that's totally different than you know hoping that you know uh, the the Jesus Christ of EDM is going to grab your hand and deliver you to the Holy Land. <laughs> you, but fair, but seriously, fair. that's what a lot of no, people expect, bro. And it's not just in music; yeah. it's in anything. You know, a lot of people yeah. wait for that moment where someone is going that's... to literally grab them from the depths and deliver them to the high heavens. And that's not how that it's worked reality. for any of us. And it's really more like you're climbing up the ladder and you have your support system around you kind of holding your ass and pushing you up. Right? If we're if we're talking <laughs> that's, Yeah. No, that's fair. That's fair. Um so uh one thing that I I feel like, you know, would be really powerful for people to hear and I'm not really sure if you've talked about it that much is like what was it like actually being you know okay i, I don't want to call okay. you actually homeless because you had a van you know like you yeah, had i i agree had the van but you know let's call what was it like being you know basically at the bottom of the totem pole living in a van day by day you know gaining and losing jobs like how does that affect you mentally how are you able to continue persevering persevering making music like following your dream when you're basically getting shit on every single day i know it and i i i feel like um a lot of it just comes from a, a place deeply rooted in every single individual on this planet is this drive to better their life and take a shot like everyone has it some people ignore it better than others um, and some people hide it better than others, but I think everyone has it. And um, being at the bottom of the barrel, like moving to LA and literally not knowing a single person, like to give you a kind of a grasp on how few friends I had when I moved to LA, I literally pulled up in my van, got on Craigslist, went into the platonic section and found nobody. <laughs> Like nobody wanted to be my friend. And I even had moments where like I would pull up to a party that I would just see and be like, oh, I'll just go hang out with my fellow kids. That and, is such uh, a David would... move, by the way. <laughs> that is such a fucking David move to just pull up to a random party <laughs> and assert yourself. I mean, they were they were filling out into the street. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to walk in. I walked in, made some friends. Next thing I knew, I had like uh, I had a like these girls, they needed a ride to go somewhere. I was like, I can give you a ride. I got my van. And they're like, oh, cool. <laughs> so I had like, I had like five random chicks hop into my van and we're driving down the road. And I'm like, yes, I'm doing it. I'm making friends. This is so tight. Here we go. And then um, one of them goes, so where do you live? And I was like, oh, I live around, I live right here. And they're like, oh, you live in this neighborhood? I'm like, no, like I live in this van. And as soon as I said that, <laughs> The uh, the friendship I thought that I had created is gone. They immediately go, oh, cool. Can you drop us off right here? <laughs> like, immediately. Yeah, and it's so, like, okay, okay. To be fair, 
You're a young girl yeah. in Los Angeles. The guy who's giving you a ride says he lives in the sketchy van that he's driving you around <laughs> I in. Know. I know. You can't blame them, but... I but, don't. But I again, don't. but again, that's exactly my point. This is what I wanted to ask you about. These are the stories that I want people to hear because, you know, like... Uh, a lot a lot of people sure people know oh you lived in a van blah 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 blah, whatever but like i want they don't know the details i know and that's what i want to talk about i want people to hear your fucking story and be like okay like he went through all of this and made a life for himself and now gets to live in a cozy home in arizona and you know you have a nice car you have you know a crow a a crow yeah Yeah, you have animals (laughs) you have a bunch of friends like and you know you've it like people need to understand and a job i wouldn't trade my life for exactly honestly. and you know it's like i think the more that people hear stories like this the more that they can be like and i know because it's happened to me you know what i mean like i've heard Absolutely. stories like this and been like what the fuck am i bitching about you know mm. like what who am i to be like Oh, I have it so hard. Blah 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 blah. No, As you know, like a, a kid who had a great childhood, supportive parents. Blah blah blah. Yeah, sure, I was fucking broke, but I always had a roof over my head. I was always able to manage to get food. Like you know, so like my struggles were not nearly what your struggles were, and not nearly what a lot of people's struggles are. And I think that that's true for a lot of people who want to do what we want to do, but also who want to do anything with their lives. And on the flip side, I think there's a lot of people who have similar situations, maybe even, you know, a lot of people who probably have a harder time than you did, you know, which, Oh yeah. Which, oh, yeah. you know, no doubt. It, it might be hard to believe, but, but it's not, I mean, you know, look around, we know oh, what the poverty no, yeah. line is in America, you know? And, and so it's like, you know, I think stories like this both are like a, a a kick in the ass to the people who, you know, think that, you know, life is so tough, but maybe it's not really that tough. But also for people where life is really fucking tough, it gives them the confidence boost to be like, OK, like I can do this. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I, I think it's a, a lot of it is just beating your brain at its own game. Like your brain wants to your brain always wants to hold you accountable to your past and all all of your failures. And so every time you have any step forward, your brain automatically says, Hey, don't forget, you just got lucky. You're going to fuck up again like this time. And it does do that every time. And I feel like it's, it's your job as an individual and, and as a person who's chasing towards something to really hone in on that and be able to like, be able to identify when your brain is just being an asshole and be able to say, ah, 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 sh- shut the fuck up. You're off to the side because your only limit in all facets of life. And we hear, we've spread it on walls since we were in first grade. It's the limit that your mind chooses, like the limit that your mind chooses as far as you will go in life every single time. I mean, <clears throat> when you look at the people who run our planet, they don't all have the same personality. They all, they all have the same attitude about success. That's the big difference between them. That we have brash, we have brash assholes all the way to quiet, nervous people, but they're all billionaires and successful. And it's because it's not be it's not because of their personality. It's because of their attitude towards success. And if your attitude towards success is that I can get this far or this far or this far, that is that's the goalpost that you set, and that's as far as you're gonna go. And once you pass it, you'll start to you know. Who knows what happens after that? It depends on the person. But um, yeah, man, like when I was when I was living in my van and like I was having to, you know, scrounge up, literally scrounge up pennies and dimes just so I could get enough gas to go to the jack in the box that I like to sleep at so I could um, get some Wi-Fi and uh, shave in the bathroom because at the uh, the jack in the box off of uh, Santa Monica Boulevard has a, uh, they have a one person bathroom situation there. So I would just go in and take over. That was, that was my bathroom. And then I'd hop on Wi-Fi, write music, wake up, apply for jobs, and then, you know, get turned down, get turned down, get turned down. (laughs) And uh, eventually got my job at American Apparel while I was walking down Venice, uh, Venice, or not Boulevard, the boardwalk on Venice. Uh, 
Uh-huh. And they came up to me and they're like, oh, yeah, you should come work there. You got you totally got the look, you know, that kind of attitude over there. <laughs> and uh, and so I go in there and <laughs> I'll make a I'll make a long story short. But they did not like me right off the bat because they had some preconceived notions about me as a person. They thought that I was just going to be this perfect like candidate for the uh, uh, the whole brand. And then one day. Um, the manager comes up to me and says, Hey, David, I need to talk to you real quick. I noticed you got out of your van this morning on the security camera and got dressed and the van didn't move from the parking lot the night before. Are you living in your van? I was like, yeah, is that like, I, I, is that all right? You know, but I, I have a friend's place over there. I had made a friend by that point. I was like, I have a friend's place over there. If you want me to sleep inside of a place, I just didn't want to be late to work. Inside of a domicile. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's and man's they, construction. They, we can live wherever we want. We're yeah. hunter gatherers, bro. Precisely. We're vagrants. We're vagrants. <laughs> <laughs> and they, uh, I'll never forget it when, um, oh, I'm not going to say his name. He doesn't deserve it. He was just doing what is. His job told him to, yeah. but the yeah. uh, manager takes me outside and uh, he says, all right, David. So unfortunately we can't have homeless people working on our floor. And I said, are you serious? He's like, yeah, I'm sorry, man. Like, it's just the way we run things around here. And I was like, you realize if I took this to court that I could sue you. And as soon as I said that, he started saying something about, he's like, were you drinking on the job? Were you getting drunk? You could tell he was like yelling it loud as if I had been recording it or something. Right. And it was really bizarre. It was a really bizarre firing. I've never had one like it. And trust me, I've had many. And um, <laughs> I did. I just didn't see it coming. And then I just was like, all right, screw this. Moving on. And then I started working for a vegan sandwich shop and got fired from that and then got another job, got fired from that. I was not a good employee is what I was learning really fast is <laughs> I just wasn't very good at doing what I was told. And I think that was a big part of why I wanted to be in the music industry. I was like, I want to make, I want to do what I love and write my own schedule to a degree. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, <laughs> I learned that from a very early age too. I was like, I feel like I was like 14 and I was sitting in class and I was just like thinking about it one day and like at, I swear I was like 13 or 14 and I was just sitting there and I was like I'm never working in a fucking office never mm. I won't do it like at that age I was just like bro like I'm doing music for a living or even at that point I was like oh, maybe I'll do film which is what I ended up you know going to college for for a whole cool. year it's not that cool literally dropped out after a year that's an, that's another story for another day but you know i just like i had this realization that i was like i will never be able to work in an office and if i ever want to make anything of myself i'm only going to be able to do it if i do the things that i really fucking care about and i think that's what school taught me the most is that you know i couldn't do homework but the second it was about something that i cared about like Bro, when I went to Icon, I was the biggest fucking, like, teacher's pet, nerd, like, geek of all time. Like, you know, kids at school would be like, oh, man, I I, I don't want to go do my Icon homework where I have to learn how to EQ this thing or something. I was like, bro, you literally are making music for homework. Like, like, yeah, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I'll do this all goddamn day. I did all the homework the second it was in, like literally I would like the second class was over I would do all the homework I would study for the tests even though I knew everything like I was like the stellar student number one bro because I love music that much you know what I mean and like I I made a realization about that and I I pursued it and you know uh it's something that I I try to tell people all the time is like if you figure out what you're actually passionate about, you can find a job in that passion. You know, even if it's like, you know, like, okay, sure, you love music to death. Maybe you're not going to be a guitar player or a DJ or a music producer, but like you could be a sound tech, you could be a this, you could be a that. There's a million ways to be in the industry that you care about the most and, you know, make a life for yourself. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. But, oh, fuck. 
what did I want to talk about, man? I've uh, we were getting to something. Well, well, what you were what you were mentioning right there was reminding me a lot of something that um I so I started reading this book uh called Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. And uh, it, it is an incredible story about um, a, a guy who pretty much had the worst childhood you could imagine, uh -huh. um, the worst teenage life you could imagine. Yeah. And and pretty much just all around shit tier existence as far as the cards were dealt. Right. And um, and he in the face of all that he went up against, you know, he went up against you know, child abuse, racism. Um, losing his stepfather. They finally found a father figure that he cared for and his stepfather was murdered. He had so many terrible things happen to him. Had a, one of a six year old have its uh, head crushed by a bus in front of him. These terrible things happened to him his whole life. And he had this one dream that he would become a Navy SEAL. And if you know anything about Navy SEAL training, you know that it is a, the absolute most difficult training that the US military has to offer. And this man literally failed it two times and by the way if you fail navy seal training you go back to the beginning it's you do the whole six months again and one of the most core fundamental principles he teaches in his book on how he was able to become this extremely decorated navy seal and extremely successful person in america is that he calloused his mind with the negativity in his life like all of the terrible things that happened to him they were no longer things that he used to say oh poor me. This happened to me. This is why it's so hard for me. And this happened to me. I, I didn't, it's not fair. It's not fair. Instead of saying that he took that and he turned it, he, he reverse engineered that negativity into positive fuel that made him feel that because he was able to go through that, that he could go through anything all the way to the point where he uh, finished his Navy SEAL training and had two broken legs doing it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's and, and that just goes to show the power of the mind man it's yeah. all in your head yeah and and you know i can relate to that so much but in such a less cool way you know what i mean yeah it's pretty and, top tier as far as like yeah holding, i definitely feel like can. a little a little bitch compared to that but i and i Same. think <laughs> i think this is something that we can all you know um uh you know uh find a common thread with and it's something that I've talked about a lot, but you know, who knows? Maybe this is this episode is the first time that someone is tuning in and they have no idea who the fuck I am. Or even if they do, maybe they've never watched any interviews I've ever done or master classes or whatever. So I I always have no problem bringing this up, even if it's the hundredth time. The the most powerful thing to me that ever happened in my career is all the people that shut me down, that told me no, mm -hmm. that told me I wasn't good enough, that ignored me, that, you know, curved me, whatever the fuck you want to call it. Like, people that I'm super close with to this day, you know. Uh, the story that I'll tell all the time is of Adventure Club, who I met a year into producing music when I was 16. And I had this opportunity to send them a remix and I sent it to them and they loved it. And this guy that worked for their team was like trying to groom me into becoming part of their team and whatever and like manage and blah, 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 whatever. And I thought I had made it. And then every song I sent him after that, because I would, had only been producing music for a year, was trash. Mm -hmm. And they just eventually mm -hmm. stopped responding to me. And I was like, oh my, like for a while I was like, dude, these guys are fucking assholes ignoring me blah 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 you know fuck these guys and then eventually finally i realized like like you missed that opportunity yeah but but it was it was honestly the biggest you know lesson that i've ever had in music where i was like oh it's not them it's me and if you can like you said have the mental fortitude to be like it's not them it's me then you can be as successful as you fucking want because the mm -hmm. only reason that people in my opinion and this is, you know, such a, a you know, a generaliz generalization, because obviously this is not the only reason, but a massive reason that a lot of people don't make it past that point of, you know, no return, if you want to call it that, is that they, you know, project all of the things that don't go right for them on other people 
or on other things. It's outside of their control. Oh, the music industry is so corrupt and, you know, blah, 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 and nepotism. And you have to be, you know, you have to pay money to a label and blah, 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 blah. Like, no. Like, you just have to realize that if people aren't fucking with your music, nine out of ten times is because your music isn't good enough yet. Or it wasn't the right song for the right person or whatever. And if you can Mm -hmm. internalize all of those things, kind of like Goggins, you know what I mean? internalizing his losses and turning that into a fuel that'll make you work 10 times harder and then eventually you'll get to the point where your shit is undeniable and eventually someone is going to come upon it and be like oh fuck this guy's tight you know and then it'll be right you know what i mean (laughs) And, and it's it's funny to me to backtrack to you know you talking about playing the side room at exchange and how much confidence that gave you because oh, yeah. I tell people all the time to not do that because they're taking away time from making music, from focusing on themselves. And, you know, and, and maybe it's because you're a different pe- person than a lot of people, but a lot of people, you know, think that that is their foot in the door. And, you know, and I'd like, you know, you to confirm this at least, but in no way, shape, or form did you performing at exchange help your career like in a real way other than giving you you know courage or confidence i guess i guess that would be the only part that i had to disagree on is the uh, no way shape or form because in in a way and in a form it did give me this boost that i was getting good enough for people's attention to even like be in a room to like not watch, you know, like who would it be? It'd be someone like Claude Von Stroke playing and like step into this tiny little dark room to the side and, and watch what I was doing. Like that did give me that extra boost when I woke up the next day, my breakfast tasted a little bit better, you know? Like no, and, I, and, and I, I agree. I agree. But that that's what I'm saying. Other than that, other but it's than not the, the end all be all. Yeah. And and that's my point is other than the confidence boost that it gave you to keep pushing, to push harder. It's not like because you were opening up at exchange, you met, you know, whoever, whatever, that wasn't your stepping stone. It was more of like, you know, fuel to the fire, so to speak. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Because I hundred percent, because a lot of people might hear you talking about opening at exchange and be like, oh, okay, I need to go find my local club. I need to go start opening up there. And then eventually, uh, and this is what, you know, you've toured enough. You, I see what you're saying. Yeah. You know what I mean? The opening DJ yeah. that plays all the music that you were going to play in your set because they want to impress you because they think that playing a set before you is going to make you walk up on stage and be like, yo, dude, your set was fucking fire. You're coming on tour with me tomorrow and I'm going to tell my manager to pick you up. You know, as opposed to mm. like, you know, the the times that I go up to an opening DJ who's a local and I'm like, yo, that shit was sick is when they play, you know, an opening set. But still, uh, the the point to kind of get back to it is, you know, the the only thing that's going to make your career go from, you know, A to Z is your music and your drive. Mm. And and, yep. you know, it, it's at the end of the day, we're music producers. We're not DJs. Like, we're not popular. We're not getting paid because we're the sickest DJs ever. We're getting paid to play shows because of the music that we create that people relate to that they want to hear live, you know? Mm -hmm. So nine times out of ten, your effort is better spent focusing on that music. But it is really cool to hear a story of someone who did do the opening DJ thing and you know it actually helped you get to that point you know what i mean it, right. from a from a yeah. mental standpoint you know what i yeah, mean it's like a it's like a cocktail of preparation luck um circumstance happenstance all mixing into one and and it and it's a different cocktail for each person like nobody ever has the exact same journey to the level that they want to reach you know i i can't imagine anyone has your exact journey or mine it's actually it's actually like fundamentally impossible for someone to have the exact same especially with how you know unique life is in general like nobody nobody really reaches their peak element in life by 
the exact same means as another person. I mean, it's not impossible, but it's definitely not plausible. You know, like, yeah, I don't know many people who grew up on farms and then decided to move into a van because the metal band didn't work out in Arizona. And then, you know, my whole bit. Uh, and I also, you know, don't know too many people who, uh, you know, have had who have had that like really, really tough hardship, I guess. I, I don't dig too deeply into uh, like like Sam, for you, what was like one of the hardest parts for you like what hey, like, was hey it... man i'm the one interviewing you bro you don't get to ask the questions dude <laughs> i'm untouchable um hold on before yeah. i answer that question though there's something really important going on in the chat right now that i need to talk about um yeah. someone said what if you lost uh, but don't forget your question because i do want to answer it what if you lost all of your drive for anything anymore due to depression or such um oh yeah that is that's a, that's a, a if if that's if that I, a i hope you're being serious in asking this and not just being like oh i'm depressed you know like a lot of people do on the internet nowadays i feel like it's kind of more like it's it's not uncommon for people to just use depression as a blanket term for being uninspired or unmotivated or unhappy but if you are seriously legitimately depressed to the point where you have lost all of your drive for anything then there's one of two answers there one you need to seek real medical help because if you because of depression have lost your drive for anything that is a serious medical problem that is not something that i can tell you oh do this and it'll get fixed like i'm not a fucking psychiatrist you know what i mean but what i can say is if because of your drive to try to make music your life, you are completely depressed and have no drive to do anything ever, then maybe that's your body telling you that it isn't actually what you want to do more than anything. And it's kind of your brain creating this, like, I'm a fan of these guys. It would be cool to be like them. And it's your brain tricking you into, and I, again, am saying this from personal experience because i went through the i want to do this because i've seen people do it and look at how successful they are and it would be cool to be that successful as opposed to the this is in my being what i want to do more than anything in the world you know what i mean mm -hmm. and i i think that you know both of the things that I said are incredibly important for anyone to hear because obviously if you are legitimately medically depressed to the point where you're not motivated for anything, please like go seek help. Like mental health in 2020 is like the arguably, you know, more normalized and understood than it ever has been. And I, you know, like I think yeah. everyone, you know, there's, there's nothing, there's no shame in admitting that you're depressed. There's no shame in going Hell and yeah, finding help. You know what I mean? I, I couldn't agree more with you on that, Sam. I think it's super important to like acknowledge when shit sucks. Like, you know, really, and and like talk to someone about it. You know, suffering in silence. You know, I I, I love my dad very much and I, and I love him so much, once again. Um, but one thing that, you know, I, I learned from him was, you know, cause he never cried around. He never, he was never sad. And so I, I kind of taught myself like, all right, if I'm sad, just, just take it, just, just fight it and just be stronger than it. You know, you can, you can get past it. But one thing I, I found was that if I just, you know, honestly spoke about how I felt, even if it was to a family member. Uh, and that's who I would speak to normally about things like that. When I speak to a family member and I just say it honestly, and then you start to feel this like wave of relief wash over you that, you know, like, like a, like a six year old would, because he's been trying to tell his parents, this ghost is real. And he finally caught it on camera and he's like, Oh, it's real. It's like, Oh my God, I'm not the only one, but you know, and it's super. And I think that is absolutely fundamental. Absolutely. And and we do live in 2020 where it is so normalized. Like I'm, I'm looking forward to going to a therapist. I personally haven't, I know that like the, the whole motto now is uh, you can go to a therapist even when you're happy. Um, and I, and I totally get that. And I just haven't had the time for it. And you know, the times are 
unprecedented as they say. And, uh, but I would love to go to a therapist and just like have an unbiased opinion of my life be told to me just because it, it would give you this new filter, this new perspective that you didn't have before. And I think that'd be cool. I, I, I'm totally with it. Like it's, it's absolutely more normalized now than ever to seek help, whether it be from a family friend or professional. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, yeah. So, uh, they said, thank you so much, guys. I think I will start seeking help them, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to, you know, put your message out there to everyone who doesn't need to read it. But seriously, go seek help. Everyone, if you ever feel like that, please, seriously. Like, I, I don't want this to turn into a fucking soapbox speech. But, like, I, I think it's a pretty important thing to talk about. That, you know, mental health is, you know... Uh, I mean, we've talked about it this entire episode about how yeah, mental fortitude is yeah. exactly what you need to get from, you know, A to B. Um, so one more thing that I want to talk about before we kind of, or there's actually two more things I want to talk about. I've had you on here for a while. So thank you for trudging through it with me. Um, Brother, I'm having fun. I'm talking with my homie. It's yeah, all good. That's why I love doing this shit, man. It's like, yeah. you know, it's informal because we're homies. It's cool because we don't get to see each other you know, thanks to COVID and also because we live in different places. So it's kind of like we get to catch up, but also because it is in this podcast interviewee format, we end up talking about, and I've found this with a lot of the episodes, we end up talking about like way more real shit than like if we're just, you know, hanging out on the couch, playing fucking yeah. Xbox, <laughs> smoking a bowl, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's it's been really cool to kind of go on this journey and like, like go to all these different places so in 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 that vein and in the vein of everything that we've been talking about for the last you know 30 minutes or so um something that's super important to me that i don't really talk about that much and something that um some of the things that you were saying not that long ago made me think of is the law of attraction are you familiar with the law of attraction at all do you apply it in your life whatsoever yeah. And I, I also feel like it's very, um, you have to be careful about how you bring up the law of attraction because some people will talk about it in the sense that like, as long as you just wishy washy about something happening, it's going to happen to you. And it's, it's a lot deeper than that. And I think that there is a really, really important part of that that gets skipped a lot. And that, um, let, let me just put it in this perspective. And this is the very centered down the middle way of getting people to kind of meet to an agreement on why I personally think the law of attraction has valid uh, applications in life is um, let's say that you were in a situation where, uh, you know, you wanted to succeed at this test. You wanted to pass a test. We'll go with something as simple as that. You want to pass this test and you have two ways of, you have two pathways to approach that test. One, you can, you know, kind of think down deep in your core that you are stupid. You can't figure this stuff out. You failed before, blah, blah, blah. You're going to have this negative aspect on it. Or this other part of you can start focusing on, I am smart enough. I have that ability. I can do that. And then start imagining what it's like to be that. And then, by the way, your brain doesn't know what's happening to it. The brain is extremely smart, but it's also really stupid in the sense that if you were to run a marathon in your mind, all of the same muscles will fire throughout your body. So your brain, just in that context alone, doesn't really know what's real or what's not. It's also why uh, websites like Pornhub are so successful because your brain doesn't realize that that's not real, that it's all it needs. It needs to see it. And it's like, okay, I'm feeling it. That means it's real. So when you, when you apply the, back to what I'm getting at is when you apply the law only, of attraction. Only it, Gasly <laughs> could take it there, dude. Only but, fucking oh, but, David. <laughs> continue so, yeah so when you apply the law of attraction we're back to the test right and you're going for this test you want to get an a on it now as you're studying one part of it for the negative side one part of you is going to be filling it up with negative context and setting up all these mental blocks essentially kind of stopping you from ever really you know absorbing information and the other version of you is open-minded to receiving that information because it's in a positive mind state because you know your your negative emotions and your positive emotions are the drugs that kind of create the concoction that is your future and the amount that you intake is the amount that you'll receive 
If you're constantly filling your head up with negativity by sitting on Twitter all day, waking up early and immediately checking your phone and then focusing on the negative in your life and feeling that negativity, it's corn just bill, billows up inside of you. And then you have to say something mean to someone on Twitter because you're angry. And you oh my God, out. David, you literally <laughs> just segued, segued me into the next thing that I want to talk about, but I want to keep going on the law of attraction for a little bit, but God damn, you literally, my <laughs> next question was going to be about, because we're both used to be super fucking bad at it. And something happened today that kind of spurred me. And like, as I was walking in here to start the interview with you, I was like, yo, I need to talk to David about this, but I'm going to hold off on it a little bit. Cause I want to touch on the law of attraction okay. and you're, you're spitting, you're spitting hot fire right now. So keep going. <laughs> sure. I'll just, I'll just finish up. I don't want to be too much of a, a blabber mouth, but ultimately like when you have that process, that mind process, sorry, that mindset that you can do something, your brain is just abjectly more open to seeing possibilities where your negative mindset wouldn't have. And I would argue that whether you believe in the law of attraction or not, it is absolute, fundamentally more beneficial to your life than going through it thinking anything negative, like literally anything negative. It, it is poison to your brain and your body. And, 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 and uh, our lives are essentially just an uphill battle against fighting our anxiety, being able to take a deep breath, unclench our jaw and just chill and know that everything's okay and that good things are coming. And, you know, that is ultimately a fact. And even if the opposite is true, which it is, bad things are coming too. They will always come. Good things will come. Bad things will come. Focusing on one versus the other obviously brings you a more fruitful life. So it's just one of those things that you can apply whether you believe in it or not. A hundred percent. And so, you know, kind of to that point, the reason that I wanted to bring up the law of attraction and it, it, it only hit me like, you know, a little bit into the, the interview after you had said it, cause you said it kind of at the beginning of, you know, when we started talking, but yeah. you said something along the lines of, you know, all the billionaires, fortune 500 CEOs, blah, 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 whatever, yeah. regardless of their personalities, they have lots of traits that they share in common. And one of those that runs through just about every single successful person, including myself, including you, including pretty much every musician, blah, 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 in some way, shape or form, even if they don't even know what the fuck it is, is the law of attraction, dude. Like, uh, I mean, right before, right when I dropped out of college, right before I started going to Icon, when I was working a day job at a, a, a you, used, you used to park the van around there, so you probably are familiar with it. Um, active board shop on the Santa yeah. Monica boardwalk. Yeah, yeah I, I worked there That's for like right. three or four months. Uh, nice. Shout out Active. Um, but so I, I was still living in my apartment with my college roommates at the time. And one of my roommates, Derek, was an aspiring rapper. And that's part of the reason that we decided to live. I mean, we were fraternity brothers. We had been friends since, you know, we literally like the first day of college, more or less. But uh, a, a big reason we decided to live together is, you know, I was a music producer. He was a rapper. I was helping him, you know, record his raps over beats. And like, you know, we had a lot in common as far as music was concerned. And he's the one who turned me on to uh, the law of attraction. And, you know, I'm not really a religious person. Or anything like that like i and and so you know when i heard about the law of attraction i was kind of like this is a bunch of bullshit whatever and he was like no dude like there's there's a movie it's called the secret and i was like that sounds even worse like this sounds like some <laughs> cheesy ass crap and you know but you know there's a there's books that i had read both for school and in my own personal life like thinking grow rich by isn't that by malcolm gladwell am i tripping i'm pretty sure I'm it's by sure. gladwell uh if you haven't read it yet both you and the chat think and grow rich uh napoleon hill sorry i believe it's who is by uh napoleon hill yeah i don't know why i said malcolm gladwell um but uh you know think and grow rich is basically about the law of attraction and it's a book that i read in uh, high school and then i read it again when i was about to go to icon and um i was like okay fuck i guess that's kind of similar to what he's talking about and i watched the movie 
and I was like, oh, fuck, this is kind of tight. And then I read the book uh, about the law of attraction, and then I read more books about it. And, you know, the funny thing is they're all kind of categorized as, quote, unquote, self-help. And self-help gets such a, uh, a negative connotation because of, you know, mm. kind of like what you were saying before. And, and it's kind of been a common theme throughout the, you know, our conversation, uh, whether I've said it or whether you've said it is, you know, self-help yeah. is essentially someone selling you something that you think you're just going to ingest, whether it's through your eyes or your ears or whatever, and it's immediately going to turn you into a successful, you know, whatever it's, it's, you know, you have to actually apply the concepts to your life. You know what I mean? You can't just like think in your head, like, I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be successful. So to keep it, you know, short and sweet, for me, what happened with the law of attraction is when I started implementing some of the concepts, you know, affirmations, waking up in the morning and looking at yourself in the mirror and telling yourself, like, I'm going to be this. I am this. I am this. Like, you know, and then I took some things from Thinking Grow Rich. Like, one of the most important things in that book to me was living like you're already at the level of success that you want to be at, you know, like for me, what that was is when I was living in North Hollywood, I would go to steampunk, which obviously we know what it is, but a lot of people yeah. here don't, doesn't fucking matter. It's a breakfast place in North Hollywood. Uh, it's actually closed now. They're going to reopen. I don't know where greatest breakfast of all time it, for me back then Shots was, out steampunk. <laughs> was super expensive, like super expensive. Like, the the amount of money that I spent on a breakfast at Steampunk was more money than I spent on food for myself for like two or three days, right? It was like 25 bucks for a breakfast. That was like more than I would spend on myself for three days. I started going there every single morning, spending 25 bucks on breakfast, living like I was already able to do it. I didn't have the fucking money, you know? I was running myself dry, but it was like, you know, doing those uh, little things like that, like... You know, waking up in the morning, looking at yourself and telling yourself that you're successful, that you are, you know, for me, it was, you know, I am a successful music producer. I am, you know, I'm already playing at this festival. I am, you know, healthy. I am in shape. And then, you know, kind of without even thinking about it, I started working out every morning. I started working twice as hard. My music started getting better. I started having this super positive outlook on life. And it like was a serious fucking game changer, but only Amen. because, yeah. only because I was, you know, like physically telling myself, like, I am these things. And then your body and your brain are like, oh, like we are these things. Like, then let's fucking act like it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I am is a powerful phrase. Yeah. And, and, you and say, that's, I am this, I am that your, your body and your brain react to it. Like you, you can, there've been dozens of studies where people have proven that if you focus on being sick, you focus on being unwell, your body will actually react to it and make you unwell. Your, your, uh, your system, your, your overall immune system drops and these, and it's not for everybody, obviously, but in these studies, they have proven that people who focus on health become healthier and people who focus on uh unhealthiness become unhealthier and it's almost as if the placebo effect has taught us something over a hundred thousand times at this point that the brain is just as powerful of a drug as the substance that we put in our stomach yeah or wherever it's like i don't, I don't know i don't want to go too deep on this because i don't want to piss anyone off um <laughs> but i almost feel like there's a little bit of that like you know, when you hear about people with, you know, incurable diseases, whether it be cancer or something else, and then they start eating super healthy and doing all these natural remedies and whatever, and they truly believe that those natural remedies are going to change their life. I wonder if part of that is the placebo effect of the, the mentality of I'm ingesting all of these things from Mother Earth that are going to make me healthier, that are going to make me stronger, that are going to make me better. And then, you know, I'm sure a lot of it has to do with the actual, you know, like you're putting great things into your body and the chemistry is working. But also, just like you said, your brain is like, I'm fucking healthy. I'm doing lots of healthy things. I'm going to beat this thing. And then it fights. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I wonder if that has any effect on it, you know? And I, like I said, oh, I, I would, 
I would go as far as to say absolutely, 100%. I mean, we have enough studies. There's enough cases. I mean, it doesn't mean that it necessarily is a perfected concept because we don't even know how the brain works in the grand scheme of things. We have no idea how our brains work. We don't even know how any of this shit works with our yeah. mind. We yeah. just have done our best to try and figure it out. So to to write it off and say it's impossible is the opposite of what the brain should be doing, which is totally. pretty much knowing that everything is possible at this point. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I think, I think we've nailed it on that. Um, guys, uh, whether you're in the chat right now or you're watching this on YouTube or you're listening to this as a podcast, um, ironically, I'm pretty sure a movie, like an actual, like, f uh, uh, fiction movie, like a, dr a drama movie came out about the secret it's like a movie about someone learning about the secret and using it to change their life and it has like i think katie holmes or some shit is in it like it's like a real movie don't go watch that, that one familiar don't go watch that one please go watch the actual movie the secret or read the book uh or read think and grow rich and go educate yourself because this shit is super powerful um i've told a lot of people a lot of times i think you know and also, when people ask me what I think I got out of going to Icon Collective, the music school I went to, I never talk about, you know, they taught me how to make sick wobs, and that's why I'm a, you know, pro producer. Like, they have an entire course that's all about the mentality of being an artist and talk about a lot of things very parallel to the, um, the law of attraction. They call it the art of flow. Um, that's what I mm -hmm. think really, you know, changed my life. And I think the law of attraction, books surrounding that, the art of flow at Icon, those things, more than anything technical I've ever learned, are what made me be where I am and who I am today. You know? Um, totally. So if you're listening to this and you think that sounds pretty cool, there's lots of information out there to uh, go find. And now I want to completely flip the script. <laughs> And talk about what you were starting to talk about, which is uh, the fact that you and I both, in our own respects and at different points in our careers, um, have been notoriously less than stellar about keeping our mouths shut on the internet. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say, no, I didn't. <laughs> like, of course, I, I think uh, misspeaking is a uh, a characteristic we all have. And yeah. it happens to everyone all the time. Just when it's on Twitter and you have a following, it, it is something that is held in a much different light. And, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, so, so let me preface it, right? I saw something today and I'm not even going to, explain who it is or what it was that i saw but it r enraged me so much to my core that i wrote the most horrible uh, ruthless just words about this person and instead of hitting send you know like i have a lot in the recent past i hit save to drafts and I gave myself a second. I walked over to Joanne and I talked to her about it. And I vocalized how I felt about it to her, you know. And even that wasn't good enough. So then I had to go on Twitter and be like, oh, what, did I, what did I say? Hold on, let me pull it up. What the fuck bullshit did I have to write to make myself feel better about myself? And that's the point here. <laughs> Is... uh. How many times can I write a nasty but truthful tweet about someone in the industry and force myself to save it in drafts because it wouldn't be good, quote unquote, politically before I spontaneously combust and turn into an actual mental case? <laughs> Del delete Twitter would be the best solution. Yeah. Far none. Yeah. That, that constant stream of anger trust me man i feel you like I, I i i see things and i read things on the internet that absolutely make my blood boil and at that point it's i feel like it's our job to like 
not give a fuck and also move on like and maybe get off the app that's ruining your your entire day like you were you were just hanging out with like for me you're like hanging out with your girlfriend or your friends and you're having a good time and then there's that one moment where everyone stops talking and the way that we're programmed now is uh, I can't have silence. I must be entertained at all times. Uh, pull out my phone and uh, get on Twitter. Uh, what the fuck did he say? And then all of a sudden you're pissed off. You're in a completely different world. You're not even there anymore. You're not even in that room with your friends anymore. And then you got to, you know, like, like you were saying earlier, you had to, you had to hit up your wife and be like, I can't fucking believe this. And you have to bring up that hatred. And it's like, why we, we don't, need that like life is already fucking hard <laughs> like yeah. i i uh i got off of twitter for about a month you know just to just to take a, a cleanse a colon cleanse from the fucking <laughs> rape that is twitter sphere <laughs> and uh i i finally one day i was like by the second day i i, I felt like i was floating i was just like oh my god like i feel good i'm I, i'm here i'm doing this i'm focused on these things you know and that's because I feel like tw if there was a CEO of depression, Twitter would be their best product, bar none, because it yeah. literally people wake up, they wake up. And the first thing I think it, the the last statistic I saw was over 85 percent of Americans check their phone within the first five minutes of waking up the first five minutes. And that sets the tone for your whole day. And if the first thing you see the second you wake up from dreamland is, you know, a, a butt-headed response to something very sensitive or someone saying something you vehemently disagree with, then how is that any way to live your life? Because how you start your day is how you live your life. And we're all starting and ending our day with, you know, whether we're getting angry at someone on Twitter, we're comparing ourselves to someone on Instagram. And we, we are just fundamentally destroying the fabric of society on a daily basis. And it's encouraged and it's all OK. And I think it's so silly. And anytime you speak up about this kind of stuff, oh, shut the fuck up, boomer. What do you know, boomer? It's like, OK, that's one way to go about it or maybe ah. acknowledge. But if you look at those same exact people's tweets, I'm so depressed. I hate my life. I hate, 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 hate. And it's like, I wonder how much fun they are to hang out with. I'm yeah, sure that they're yeah. a successful and happy and thriving individual. Yeah, I know. I've I've learned that now when someone says something, you know, malicious or fucked up about me or to me or whatever, I click on their profile, I look at their three most recent tweets, and if it's a bunch of other negative bullshit and or I'm so sad about my life, then instead of responding to it, I'm just like, okay, I'm going to leave it alone. Cause obviously this person is going through it and they're using me as their outlet and they're punching bag and that's okay. I don't need to stoke mm -hmm. the fire. I don't need to bring myself down to that level. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, I mean like what's what, what go ahead. I, I was just going to say there's a couple things that I feel about this because you know, I am, I was born in 1993. I was, you know, I'm a part of the generation that got to see technology really unfurl before our eyes and, you know, the advent of the modern internet and all of these technologies that have made our lives so fucking cool. Um, you know, like I, I'm not going to get into the back of my it day fucking, cool. fucking thing, but, it, but like, hmm. I love technology. I'm on fucking Twitch right now, dude. Like I play video games yeah. <laughs> all day. I'm an electronic music producer. My entire life revolves around technology advancing and I love technology and I love social media. You know what I mean? I love being able yeah. to go on Twitter and, you know, uh, go to the browse section, see what is going on in the world, current events, and then be able to kind of go in and wait, wade through the bullshit find real first-hand accounts about things that are actually going on in the world there's a lot of benefits to twitter it's also my favorite place to actually yes. post because it's the most instant reaction i hate posting on instagram i hate posting on facebook i hate fucking snap uh, uh instagram story tiktok all that bullshit i fucking hate it like on twitter <laughs> all i have to do is just say words or post a picture and people you know do whatever but there are all of these negatives and it's, you know, we could go into this for fucking years about it, but I specifically want to talk about us and the things that we've done and said, because both of us 
And I think we're both now kind of out of that point and can kind of, you know, look back on it and, you know, recognize that, like, you know, there was a point where Dylan Francis was on Hot Ones, you know, the YouTube series, and he called me a little bitch to, like, hundreds of thousands of people. Like, the I can't remember what the question was that he was asked, but he specifically, I think it was back in 2016 or 17, singled me out for being a little bitch. And you know what? It's probably because I gave him good reason because I would bitch and complain about everything on the internet. And I used it as my personal sounding board. And without censoring myself, I would just be like, this fucking sucks. And this fucking sucks. And this guy's a dick. And fuck you, American Airlines. And blah, 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 blah. You know, I just, I had no filter because I'm a, you know, I was, still am, not as much, but I was a zero fucks given kind of person. And I think it's, you know, a lot of why we both got to where we are and why we're friends because we both give zero fucks about a lot of things. Right. And I used to give zero fucks about what I said and who it hurt. You know, I was going to speak the way that, um, uh, you know, I feel about something and not censor myself to, you know, be politically correct. And I say politically as in music industry, politically, right um and you know i feel like you've done very similar things you know you've called out a lot of people i've called out a lot of people we've gotten in, into it with people when we really didn't need to and like you know like what happened today i almost went back to that same bullshit and i would have been totally justified saying what i had said you know what i mean if i had hit send on the tweet that i was going to send today I would have been completely justified. No one would have told me that I was wrong or I was an asshole, you know, but still I'm sitting there and I'm like looking at it and I'm like, fuck, is this really the person I want to be? You know, and it's a lot about what you just said, you know, we're contributing to our own, you know, mental degradation or whatever you want to call it. Like I see something, I think negative thoughts about it. I act on those negative thoughts and then you perpetuate the negativity and then that leads to more and more and more and more negativity. So, like, how did you get yourself out of it? Uh, personally, I mean, like, I all, all it took was uh, realizing that not every single thought needs to be shared. And that's what Twitter ultimately asks for, is for you to share. What's happening? What's, in, you know, like, it tells you the second you open the app, what's happening? You know? Oh, fucking dirt stuff, fucking, fucking boop, I said fucking, you know, like it already invites you to complain. Like the second yeah, you open it up. Yeah, it does. And we, <laughs> you know. we, we used it the way it was intended for sure. <laughs> for sure, dude. Yeah. I mean, we were, we were literally using the app for the way it was intended, but you know, our culture is in a very vast shift right now and things are not the way they used to be. They, and that's just a that's a simple rundown of and the easiest way to say it. They are just not the way they used to be. When you look at comedies from like the early 2000s, they say some shit where you're like, oh, my God. Yo, you know? yo, Joanna and I 2020 filter. It's a completely different movie. And you're like, are these people still alive? And then you realize, oh, yeah. no one cares because it was back then. We yeah. only care now. Yeah. Joanna but and I's at favorite. At the same time, we cancel people who are dead, which is. By the way, I just want to say there there has to be a leash on this dog. It's eating. It's literally going after dead people. It's going after people who, you know, just have a slight, the slightest difference in opinion or the slightest misspeaking. And if you just misspeak just the right way, now you're on grounds to have everything taken from you. And what reality is a, a, a thriving society, one that polices itself and constantly tries to eat each other alive, no matter how benign the situation is. Like the, the words that were said, whether they offended you or they pissed you off or they stood for something you don't agree with, it is still ultimately just words in the wind and conversation. And, and does that mean that this person should have their entire life, everything that they've done, every their, all the good things they've done, are obviously not on the table. All the good things they have said on Twitter or all the good things they have done for, you know, any kind of community, all of that is off the table. Yeah. We're going to take a magnifying glass. David, I feel like you're getting, you're, you're, you're going down a rabbit hole right now that isn't necessarily the topic of conversation here. And I'm only stopping you because if we go down I'm, this, no, 
if we go down this I'm hole, I'm not trying to go down a rabbit hole. I'm just telling you how I got out of it. I'm telling okay. I'm, I'm answering right. your question. Okay. Okay. I'm saying this was the part of my thought process was I got had it. to, got I got had it, to realize it. what I was, what, what, what our culture had, you know, shifted into in order to kind of realize it wasn't ever like, Oh, you know what? I want to censor myself and never speak my mind. It was all, and it was also the fact that, like, you know, my a lot of my brand is built off of me being very honest and open and sharing my experiences with people. I feel the same and way, dude. For for me to always, for me to like make sure that I say it perfectly every time, it's it's a it's a difficult thing because the rules are always changing. The rules are changing every day, and so I've I've learned that you know. Ultimately, I'm going to be myself and I'm going to be honest and I'm not going to censor myself to a degree where I have a muzzle over my face, but I will, I've still taken into account the fact that there are, you know, lots and lots and lots and lots of people saying the things that I say, and I should definitely consider the weight of those words. And I feel like that's a responsible thing to do if you have a following. Absolutely. But uh, I'm not going to create a new version of myself to appease of a select group of people who get angry on the internet. Sorry, I, I'm I I am the I am my personality, and I'm going to be honest with my fan base. And if uh, if I say something that really pisses you off, go ahead, be upset. That's fine. You have every right. Go ahead, do whatever you want to do. Be upset, but ultimately, I just don't really give a fuck what you have to say anymore. I'm going to be myself to the degree that I think is necessary, but also. What's so fucking toxic about Twitter, the worst part of it, is I never intended to make Gasly as a platform that had to have stances on anything, you know? I wanted it to just be, the only time I ever wanted to speak on anything that was real is like, you know, person, person to person interaction all the way to, you know, like how to get through hard times. Like that was kind of the ultimate brunt of it. And now it's 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 very different now and now people have to every single dj now has a a strong strong opinion about shit that really matters and it's very public and you know it is good for people to express that if they want to i have no problem with that it's just very different landscape than you know what uh the music industry was just not even three or four years ago completely different and um, whether it's for the best or the worst, uh, it's yet to be seen, um, hopefully for the best. But uh, I, I think that, like I said earlier, there, there should definitely be a limit to uh, how easily someone's life can be taken from them. And there needs to be a road to redemption if someone does fuck up. If you do fuck up, there should be some kind of road to redemption. It's clearly abundant in the hip hop industry, but not so much in the EDM industry. Yeah. And, you know, uh, like I said, I feel like these are two almost completely separate topics because there's nothing that I can say or you can say that's ever, that's going to, you know, solve that problem. I'm trying to, you know, uh, uh, um, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm trying to, you know, kind of hone this in on the two of us as actual people and, you know, not, not about us saying things that people think are in bad taste but just specifically about us you know essentially talking shit to other people that make us mad you know what i mean like you should call bullshit you should call bullshit when you see it i mean if you really right. if it really means something to you, you should call bullshit i mean yeah. these, the very people who do this stuff that's all they do so why what what makes it so that you can't call bullshit on someone? If someone does something that you think is in poor taste, you should have a right to say. And you know, by the way, it's always our fault. Whatever happens after that, right. whatever happens after you after you open that box, you can't close it. So you have to really think about it. Is this worth my time and energy and focus? And I'll tell you right now, uh, point blank, nine times out of ten, no. <laughs> nine times out of ten, no. And it that was my question. My that that was my question and that's what i was doing when i was looking at my phone today and i was ready to fucking you know start this war with this dude that i don't even really know over nothing you know what i mean like mm. I, like would it have been worth you know a having this dude who i don't even really know i've met in person like in passing like twice if that right 
going from that person having a neutral to nothing opinion about me to immediately being like, you know, this dude, if he hears my name, is going to be like, fuck that dude, right? Like, is it worth having that? Especially for someone who works in the same industry as us. Two, is it is it worth... (laughs) But it but it gets deeper than that. You know what I mean? Okay. Then it's like there are people that work with that dude who support that guy who then are not going to fuck with you because you talk shit to that guy. And then there's going to be people in the industry who won't want to work with you because they're like, oh, man, like, look at what he said about this guy. Like, why is he starting fights out of nowhere? Like, he's, you know, like... Like, we we don't want to work with someone that is, like, you know, uh, that, like, brash and aggressive. Like, you know, can't control himself on social media and blah, blah, blah. It's not the right image for us. And, you know, if you had asked me three years ago how I felt about exactly what I just said, I would be like, fuck all of that. I'm going to say exactly what the fuck I want. I'm not censoring myself for anyone. I'm going to call bullshit when I see it. But at this point in my career, I'm just like, what am I doing for myself other than causing a hundred problems just to, you know, give myself a little bit of like, uh, yeah, I fucking, I stuck it to the man, right? So him. Yeah. 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 Who did I oh, tell? That's... Who did I fucking tell? <laughs> like the things that I was going to say today, people already know. Other people are already saying, why do I need to get in on it? To make myself feel better, to validate myself in my own eyes, you know? Because at the end of the day, that's kind of what I feel like it is. It's like, if I don't say it to that dude, if you don't call out the bullshit that you see, then you see yourself as, you know, a bullshitter or a fake or a fraud or a suit or whatever, you know? And like, so I guess for me, it's like, how do I, you know, continue to like remind myself that like (laughs) those things should be beneath us? Right. I guess the the uh, one worded answer to that would be stoicism. Like uh, yeah. stoic philosophy has been uh, really important in my life lately. I'm I'm not perfect at it by any means. I do not think so. But it is a very important ground rule for engaging with any kind of negative behavior. Is your emotions are essentially just vibrations, but your brain chooses how you you choose how you react to your emotions. Your emotions don't control you. And I think a lot of people let their emotions control them. When you let your emotions control you, you punch a hole in the wall or you, you know, drive your car and off into the distance and leave your wife. I broke my, uh, I I slammed my first ever MacBook pro that I got when I was 16 or 17. Uh, I threw it, uh, because my, my ex girlfriend had, you know, broken up with me or something for the 14th time. Yeah. And I was so mad that I, you know, being dramatic and being in a movie, threw it into my closet, uh, not expecting anything to happen and ended up completely shattering the computer. Uh, it, it was usable, but like, it was one of those things where like the, the bottom frame was like this, <laughs> you know what I mean? That was a huge yeah. lesson yeah. for and, me. And then as soon as you do that, as soon as you did that, I guarantee you this rush of sobriety just surged through your mind and you said, oh, God damn it. I don't oh, yeah. even care about this bitch that much. I wanted that laptop, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I used that laptop for another three years and it was a very, you know, <laughs> strong reminder of, uh, you know, not losing your cool like that. Yeah, um, um, but yeah. yeah I, when you Go ahead. I was just going to say, when you, uh, when you react to your emotions, you're never reacting. When you, when you follow your emotions and you let your emotions control you and your reactions, you are almost every single time making the wrong choice. Unless it's from love. If you're doing something with love and you're reacting to emotions of love, you're probably going to do something that's going to make someone happy and you happier. Life's better. Yay, yay, yay. The world's fucking slightly brighter sunshine. But as soon as you're reacting to your negative emotions, like you let your negative emotion come inside of you and oh God damn it. And if you, once it comes inside of you, it takes over you. And it, and if you react to it the way that the emotion wants you to, I'm sorry, what was that? Every single t- <laughs> 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 you know, you know, when, when, when that negativity comes inside of you, 
There's okay, I just wanted to make sure that I uncomfortable I just, feeling. I just wanted and, to make sure know, I heard that right. Continue. Yeah, yeah, it's inside you, and uh, what? <laughs> but you don't want it to come out. Like you can let a negative emotion come inside of you, but don't let it come out. You know. Oh that's, that's my really god! What I want to drive in. Fuck. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh man well if you didn't know ghastly the, before this that was probably the most ghastly way to uh <laughs> to, to <laughs> oh my fucking lanta dude okay this, but that uh, uh, jokes aside that's just fucking real man like that is fucking real like no nah, 200 200 percent yeah yeah. Every time you react to your negative, it never turns out good. It never yeah. turns out good. Yeah. Not in all my life have I ever done something reacting to a negative emotion where I was like, the next day I was like, you know what? I'm really glad. I'm really glad that I fucking, you know, uh, spray painted my ex-girlfriend's car or something like that. And now I got a lawsuit or something like that, which didn't happen to me. I'm just giving a situation. Right. Yeah. No, that wasn't David. That was some other guy. Yeah. Yeah. Some other guy that spray painted my ex's car. Yeah. Um. <laughs> um. Regardless of how ghastly that final statement was, yes, it was a hundred percent on the nose. It was super accurate. Um. I, I I think that we're at a point now where we can end the show on a light note. There's a couple sections. They're super super quick that I like to do with every single person that's on the show. Um, yeah, there, it's kind of like game showy, you know what I mean? So there's two games. One is called quick bites and it's basically, I'm going to put two things side by side and without thinking about it, you just have to, uh, you just have to choose one, right? Like, okay. like I say them and immediately you have to answer, you know, just gut instinct, right? I'm not going to give you any time to deliberate. And then after that, we'll do a section called fight or bite, which is uh, obviously fight is like you don't like something. Bite is you do like something. It's not like bite like you're biting them aggressively. It's bite like, mmm, that's delicious. I'm going to take a bite. I want a bite of that. Copy. Yeah, yeah, cool. Super simple. Uh, we'll start off easy uh, with quick bites. It'll get a little bit um, more difficult as it goes on. Bring it on. All right. Quick bites. Number one. Dogs or goats? Goats. I, I, I figured, but I mean, I don't know. But it, wait, it depends on... Uh, well, no, 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 <laughs> no. That's the point of this. Gut reaction. Okay. I said dogs or goats. All you right. said goats. That's your answer. You can now right. kind of explain yourself, but there's no changing your answer. Like... The whole point was like... Oh, I wouldn't change it. So, I wouldn't change it. But do, do you have a dog now? Or was that like a roommate's dog or something? Uh, I, I like I, I have dogs, but I, I actually moved my dogs to my dairy farm because I have my crow now, which is so <laughs> much work, dude. <laughs> the crow literally takes up so much of my time. Like, I love Edgar. I love him a lot. Yeah, in case you didn't know... Lot. David's last name is Crow, like C O C R O W E. His Crow's name is Edgar Allen Crow. Edgar <laughs> Allen Crow. He's a living joke, just like me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Okay, we'll get to we'll get to Edgar in a second. Um okay. Yeah. So goats, obviously goats grew up on a goat farm. I get it. I get it. It was a softball. All right. I told you we'd start right, off right, easy let's... and then it'll get, you know, a little bit more, you know, a little bit tougher. So, all right, let's go. Question number two. Would you rather be completely homeless, but touring full time, but no matter how much money you make, you're still homeless or... You live a nice, comfortable life. You have a great house, but you never tour First ever. One. You don't ever get to play a show. First one. Okay. First one. I, I thought Far so, enough. but most people would answer the other way. If you asked me, I can understand. I would much rather have a comfortable life, nice house, no touring ever, because as much as I do love touring, and you know, it's ev it's everything I've ever wanted to do. 
from, you know, the age I was six years old, right? I've also, you know, throughout the six years of touring realized, especially now being home so much, how much I love being home with my wife, with my dogs, like living a normal life. It's like super fucking sick, dude. Like, oh, yeah. You know, oh, if I had a wife, I'd probably have a different answer for you, brother. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a that's a huge that's like that's a huge thing to have in your life. That's so but cool. Like, like, but like, you're don't get love, me wrong, like, permanently. dude. How cool. Bro, like, you know, like, like you get the tour all the time. But like when you come home, you have zero dollars and you're living under a bridge. I mean, I, I could only do that because of the fact that like when I'm if I'm if I'm on tour all the time then I would also have hotels. Yeah, so I yeah, guess I would okay, just be a hotel all right, vagrant. yeah, 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 okay, <laughs> fine. I kind of set you up for that one. I guess that makes sense. I mean, it's kind of like What's So Not. He was basically a homeless touring vagrant for, like, years. I think he still is. He hasn't had a place to call home for, like, I swear to God, like, four years. He just consistently no way, really cool. is traveling. He has, like, one giant suitcase that all of his stuff lives in and he just lives everywhere la asia australia fucking wherever like you know it just doesn't it doesn't even matter to him which is you know if you can live that life it's pretty sick um okay let's keep it going though number three would you rather be in a successful metal band or be you as ghastly currently right now Oh, that's a tough one. That one is actually really hard. How successful of a metal band are we? You're talking? making are the same amount of money life? either way. Same amount of money, same. Mm, bro, you really put me on the spot with that one. I that's told you it was gonna get harder. That is that is a lot harder. I have to explain before I answer. Like there is, there's things about the metal lifestyle that you just can't replicate in EDM. Like you know, I can't get on the mic and scream from the pit of my guts, somebody fucking rip someone's head off, and that be totally cool as people start attacking each other. Unless I'm in metal. You know, like yeah. metal, like that was that was the most glorious part was, you know, like I, I would jump in the pit, I would get a bloody nose. It was it was just absolute anarchy, uh -huh. you know? And then and then, you know, I I fell out of that industry. You're completely and missing the point of this entire game. I know, I know, I'm totally missing it. Fine. Uh, I think I would still stay with Gastly, to be honest. But, okay. you know, because the, there is, I do love the love and I do love like the atmosphere and everything that we've created with our culture. It's very cool. I just look back on those days very fondly. Those bloody, bloody dance floors and, abs you know, pentagrams on everywhere. It was just pure evil. It was absolutely evil. Dude. <laughs> I asked you this question because I ask myself the question all the time. The reason I would stay doing what I'm doing is I don't have to worry about a band to write all the music for me. I don't have to like, you know, even if you're making the same amount of money, like I still feel like we have to deal with a lot less overhead, a lot less stress being a yeah. one man band than being in an actual oh, yeah. band. But I do have days where I'm like, I would literally tra turn all of this in to just play guitar in a metal band and like play it like some like legitimate sick rock festival. Like I was literally like earlier today watched like two and a half hours of just no effects fucking live. Do you know no effects? The punk band? Of course. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I figured, but I just had to make sure. No Effects is like one of my favorite bands of all time. And I was watching just, you know, videos of them. And they're like a 30 year old fucking rock punk band, dude. You know what I mean? But like I was watching videos of them like recently doing these massive rock and metal festivals. And just like the energy and the atmosphere of those crowds is just something that we in electronic music do not understand and do not get. And a lot of people say like, oh, the energy in dance music is so you know, so much better than everywhere else. And it's so, you know, unmatched, but like, dude, you, you watch some bands like, you know, whether it was no effects or Metallica or whatever, like those massive rock and metal bands, like, dude, those crowds are, are, are something else. And I would seriously like give a limb to get to experience that shit. Um, so I get why that was tough for you. I do. Mm. 
Um, okay. You ready for a real zinger? All right, let's go with the zinger. Uh, I normally do five, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end on this one. All right. Because... Yeah, we've been going for quite a while, yeah. Yeah, we have. We're cool. almost wrapped up. Don't worry. Good to catch up with you, brother. I know, same. Um, okay, this is, the, this is the zinger of all zingers. And you just have to think of the, like, societal implications to how you answer this question. Would you rather have Edgar Allan Crow with COVID or would you give up ever having Edgar Allan Crow to eliminate COVID from ever happening on the planet Earth? <laughs> my crow's gone, dude. Of course. Okay. okay. I like my bird. My bird's cool. I love him, but I, I, I probably wouldn't have got him if it wasn't for COVID because it was like, well, I stuck at home. I literally do nothing but write music and cook food. I might as well raise a baby crow. Yeah. You know, that was just the next logical step for me. Yeah. I mean, I feel like Edgar has become much more of a child than a crow. Yeah. He's like literally he's like, to. he's literally like a, a baby or like a puppy. Yeah. Like he follows you everywhere. He's literally yeah, on your shoulder really all day. Like it's, it's pretty fucking funny. <laughs> So I can yeah. I, I I imagine the attachment you have, which is why I felt like that was a zinger. Oh I, yeah, I, I I love him, but I think I care about you know planet Earth a little bit more than the one bird. You know, yeah. <laughs> I would if I let's let's say I I feel like I I just want to I want to revise your question real quick. What if if Edgar Allan Crow's blood had the uh the ant the proper chemicals for a proper vaccine? Yeah, I'd still give up Edgar. <laughs> like straight. Okay. Up. Okay. Okay. I love I love my bird, man, but I I I, th I do miss playing shows and having a normal life. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> you passed. You passed the test. Uh, I'm sorry, right. Edgar, but he doesn't even know what the fuck we're talking about because he's a fucking crow and yeah. he has a crow brain. Exactly. He's just gonna squawk. He doesn't yeah. care. <laughs> he's like, what? What the fuck you just say? <laughs> All right. Anyways. Okay. Five fight or bite questions. They're literally one word. You just say fight or bite. They're all super quick and easy. Uh, a couple of them are, you know, uh, topics in fight or bite that have been consistent throughout every single episode of In the Tank. Um, and I like to keep yeah. them in there just, uh, you know, for funsies. And then there's a couple mm -hmm. that I threw in there, not necessarily because I know you. There's nothing really specific in there. That was really more what Quick Bites was for. They were just more ones that i thought might be funny uh so okay. why don't we just get into it fight or bite let's just jump into it topic number one diplo uh fight fight you're the first person <laughs> to fight diplo explain yourself i love diplo i love diplo but you know it'd be cool to fight i like fighting people it's fun <laughs> okay, not exactly the point of the uh, game show here, but I'll 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 let your answer pass. I'll give you I'll give you a pass, but just for the future, fight means you don't like them. Bite means you do like oh. it. Oh, okay, all right. I was no, thinking it's of, fine. Like, it's fine. You can like, you can sorry, yeah. you can say that you want to fight Diplo. That's totally fine. I'll <laughs> that's that's cool. I'll I'll let your EDM know tomorrow so that they can set well, up. He'll the, probably kick my ass, but you know I would still fight. I like fighting. Yeah, whatever. That would be great. I think we should make it a pay-per-view event. Kind of like the... Yeah, let's do it. You know what? I was I was about to bring up a name that has two words in it that I don't even want to bring up because I feel like we're going to go down a dark place. Down to a dark place <laughs> if I even bring up the name. So, never mind. <laughs> Continuing. Fight or bite. Subject number two. K-pop. Oh, bite. Yeah, you like K-pop? I don't know. I hate K-pop. Fight. Fight would be that you don't like it. <laughs> but I, I, I love it for what is it's created. It's created this whole subsection of entertainment that is, you know, it's kind of cool. Like I I don't I don't listen to it, but I, I appreciate it. This I always have I have so much nuance in my answers. I suck for this. Let's go. <laughs> uh no, that's fine. You're allowed to answer however you want. You're you're you are 
a free spirit flowing in the wind. Um, okay. Hey, thanks, man. Fight or bite, subject number three. In and out burger. Oh, bite. I mean, thank you, but you'd be surprised how some people answer that question. And that's why it's been consistent throughout this whole thing. Because in three years, four years, ten years from now, I want to look back and I want to have a ticker of all the people who have came onto the show and said that they don't fuck with In-N-Out because I'm just going to stop talking to them. Because <laughs> that shit is just completely heinous and erroneous. It's fucking bullshit. It is not okay. Uh, does In-N-Out have veggie stuff? Uh, no. The closest thing it has to veggie stuff is what, like a grilled cheese? Right? Which is just yeah, two you get buns the with the cheese fucking or, cheese. Yeah, or, you know, french fries. Yeah, which are technically vegetarian, but I'm sure they're in animal fats. Like, that's how they fry them. So it's not it's not even close to vegan, and I'm not even sure if vegetarians would eat them, but they probably do. Anyways. Um, okay, someone in the Twitch chat just said that In-N-Out is ass. You better retract your statement, otherwise you're going to get a perma ban. We love In-N-Out on this chat, bro. It's not a fucking joke. Anyways, fighter bite number four, Hollywood undead. Uh, bite. You fuck with Hollywood undead? There was some songs that were pretty cool, and they were doing something that now is so popular. Sad boy emo rap. That's essentially what they were doing. Was like a, a their own version of sad boy emo rap. You know, like they they were. They talk about the, the pioneers of it. It wasn't. It. Let's be real. Let's be real. If if Willie Nelson can, you know, I'm not saying he's a pioneer of country, but definitely one of. If he's a pioneer of country and then country can turn into Ford trucks and beers and shorts and jeans, you know, essentially a completely different version of it. It couldn't have got there without that. So I don't think that... Um, I feel like Hollywood Undead and like all the people ooh, who are ooh, making like ooh, wait, 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 screamo wait. hip hop. I, I I hear your point. I still don't agree, but that's okay. But someone in the chat just actually gave me an even better question. Closer to a quick bite than a fighter bite, but whatever. Who fucking cares? Hollywood Undead or Broken Side? Broken Side. Like of the two, which you think is better? Yeah. Well, oh my. I've I don't know I don't know Broken Side quite as well as Hollywood Undead. I only know one that I really really like, but yeah, I retract. Yeah, Hollywood Undead. Okay. Now that I think okay, about fair it. enough. Um, yeah, when I was a big metal kid, not that I still am not, but um, I had a big problem with both Broken Side and Hollywood Undead. But if I had to pick between the two, I would pick Hollywood Undead, I think. I'm sure they're all incredible people, and honestly, I feel bad talking shit about anyone in music ever anymore, but that shit just irked me to my core. But you know what? It's not about me. It's not about me. This is all about you. This is all about you. And you answer the question. It's about us. Um. So... We're on our final one, and before I ask this, I just want to say thank you for sticking with me through these two hours. I think, I mean, I feel like from the comments that I've got from the chat today, like, this has been everyone's, like, favorite episode, like, That's ever. That's awesome, man. Like, Very I feel cool. like a lot of the stuff that we talked about is a lot of shit that people need to hear, and that's exactly why I started this podcast, is to try to, you know help people in their lives, whether yeah, they're a fucking musician or a uh, 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 a fucking business person or whatever it doesn't fucking matter you know yeah. um so thank yeah, you yeah thanks for having me on i'm happy to be here man of course absolutely. absolutely you know like when you hit me up about this you know as a drop of the hat type thing you're my boy absolute hell yeah okay so to close out the show we have one more fighter bite i already know what you're gonna say but i ask it every time it's always the final question hollywood boulevard Oh, uh, beat beat the shit out of fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's been the general consensus. I think that I lived there. It was awful. <laughs> yeah, it's not the greatest. 
And I, <laughs> I think the reason that I specifically ask about Hollywood Boulevard all the time is because, you know, I'm sure you were victim to it. Everyone who isn't from California or isn't from Southern California, they move to L.A., and they decide to move to Hollywood for some fucking reason because it's where all the famous people are and it's where all the magic happens and blah, blah, blah. And it's the fucking most horrible place that's ever been created. It is a fucking cesspool <laughs> of horribleness and depression and, you know, used needles. And just, it's not the place, like, if every time someone talks to me and they're like, yo, like, I'm thinking about moving to L.A., I'm like, all right, cool, just make sure it's not Hollywood. And they're like, what do you mean? That's exactly where I was going to move. And I was like, don't do it. Don't fucking do it. I promise you, you will regret your decision. And uh, yeah. so, yeah. I'm hoping that maybe by episode 50 of this, I've said it enough times and enough people have agreed with me that some, someone will listen and they'll be like, oh, shit, okay, so I'm not going to move. I'm not going to move to Hollywood. I'm not going to do it. And then I'll have done my job. I feel like I will have saved someone. You know what I mean? And if I can just save one person, yeah. then I, I feel content in my life. Uh, okay, <laughs> one more question before you go. Jackson asks, where's the best place to live in Los Angeles? Oh, man. Uh, my, my best experience in LA, honestly, and, my per and this is just my personal, anyone who takes this as a, as, a, as a slight, it shouldn't be. I mean, people are allowed to have different preferences in where they live. Um, I really, really enjoyed living in like North Hollywood and Studio City, these areas. It's just outside of the city enough to where it's accessible, but you also can get some semblance of peace because I lived in downtown for the last year and a half when I was in LA. And between, I you know, know, we were next the, door the, neighbors, even though we never <laughs> saw yeah. each other, but whatever. <laughs> Bro, but that was when we were both like traveling yeah, constantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. everything was a completely different kind of shit show. Um, but you know, waking up to sirens and people, uh, fighting in the street and ambulances and car horns. And it just wasn't, it wasn't my bag. I can get how some people can fuck with it. You know, they want to be in the vein of it all. Like I get that. I totally get that. That's why I moved to downtown, but it just ended up not being for me. I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed my peace whenever i can get it and now i've gotten too much of it unless i open my phone so it all depends <laughs> yeah yeah and the funny thing is i would say and we only lived about a block from each other yeah. but i would still say i've lived a lot of places in los angeles i lived in marina del rey i lived in north hollywood i lived in west hollywood and now i i technically still live in the arts district um but just the difference between our two buildings you know, mine is, like, there's only, like, 20 people that live in it, all ground floor units, kind of removed from everything. My building is super quiet and super mellow, and I I actually yeah. feel like the Arts District was my favorite place I've ever lived in Los Angeles. Wow. Just in terms of practicality, uh, the in terms of how easy it is to get to every different part of the city, and also just all the fucking sick restaurants and just the vibe of the area. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, no, I, I love the arts. That district, being said, but... I'm currently selling one of my units and trying to get a house in Orange County. So, I mean, that tells you where my head is at right now. You know what I mean? There you go. So, you there never you know. That's why I got my house, man. I'm right there with you. It's yep. just like there's there's something special about when you have your own property and you can just walk outside butt-ass naked and just meditate and like sit your ass on the grass and nobody's going to be upset. Cause I'm, I'm sick of people, you know, like getting upset when I just do my nudist thing. And so I got my own property and now it's all good. Are you telling me that's why you decided to get your own property? It was a big, big factor. It was a large, that factor, was a big was. factor. <laughs> yes. This is news to me. <laughs> what the fuck dude, kind of nudist I, bullshit were you trying to do in the arts district, dude? Bro, I had access to the roof, but it's not like I could ever go meditate naked on the roof. It's Did you cool. try? I thought about it, but I never could. This is okay. why okay. I left. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> All right. I think that's a perfect place to end. I need to go mentally process that. Everyone, right, fair. say goodbye to David. Thank you so much for sticking around for so fucking long, man. That was awesome. Yeah, of course. Um, that was a great time. Yeah, I mean, fuck the interview and all that. I miss you. 
I know we saw each other not yeah. that long ago, but we don't get to do this shit enough. Uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate you uh, coming here and doing this, man. Absolutely, brother. It was my honor, and uh, I love you, man, and thanks for having me on the show. Likewise, dude. All right. Have a good one, brother. Peace out. Later, bro. All right, guys, that will do it. That was a journey. I know. I told you. I tried to prepare you. I hope that you really took a lot from this episode. I think there was so much incredible information in there. Uh, And I also hope you enjoyed it because I had a blast doing this podcast with David Gasly. Make sure you go follow him on socials. Uh, He's, you know, at Gasly or slash Gasly everywhere you can find Gasly. Um, And on that note, if you're enjoying the podcast, if you're a first time listener, if you've seen all the the podcast episodes, whatever it may be, let me know how you feel. If you're watching on YouTube right now, make sure you drop a comment below. And if you're listening to the podcast everywhere that podcasts are available, uh, hit me up on Twitter. Use the hashtag in the tank. Let me know how you feel. Give me suggestions for new episodes. Uh, Tell me I suck. It doesn't matter. Either way, I'm here for you and I want to hear from you. Until then, I'll see you guys next week. Much love. Have a good day. Have a good month. Have a good rest of your year. Peace out.